Good day, everyone, and welcome to another insightful session on the Think Big Radio Zoom platform. Thrilled to be your host today. Guys, we have a powerhouse conversation lined up for you. I'm Ken Big Blake, your go-to expert in real estate business and funding. I'm honored to be joined by a true luminary in the field of assisted living, Felton Wooten. With over 40 years of dedicated and award-winning service, he's been a beacon in the assisted living industry, consistently setting the standard for excellence, which you will find out some of that this evening. So we're going to delve into that wealth of knowledge and experience that he brings to the table. Sit back, grab your notepads, get ready for a conversation that promised to be enlightening and empowering. So before we officially start, Felton, how can our listeners reach you? Big, uh, the listeners and viewing audience can reach me by going to the website, and the website name is qualityoflifeeldercare.com. Again, that website is qualityoflifeeldercare.com. Okay, great. So what we're going to do is uh, we'll put that in the description so that you guys will be able to uh, see that and copy that link. Uh, we're also sharing that page at this moment. But before we uh, actually start, how about just sharing with our listeners your passion for this industry, how you got started, and some of the accomplishments uh, that you've done over this uh, course of 40 plus years? Passion comes from just recognizing of taking care of the greatest gift of life and it started when I worked in the hospital as a nursing assistant in the psychiatric unit. And in that unit, I saw people that would get admitted and they were uh, in a bad mental state and you could see the pain of their family members. And after the treatment, and at that time it was shock therapy was used, I would see people would go home and I felt like they were going to be successful. Then I saw others uh, that I pretty much knew they were coming back. And as a result of taking care of the patients, there was a situation uh, as a nursing assistant. I thought that I was not valued. And I also thought that um, the registered nurse just didn't uh, take me seriously. And as a result, when I took my patient out and the patient ran away and I came back, I had shared with them what the patient said they were going to do. And at that point, I went back and changed my major to public administration, concentrated in healthcare and personnel administration. And as a result of taking care of people, I wanted to make sure the patients were taken care of with love and respect, I want to make sure that the family members, when they left their family members in the care of a facility and caregivers, that they knew that they, their family members were going to be treated with tender love and care. But most importantly, I wanted to make sure that the employees were taken care of, they were respected, they were schooled on what was necessary to become a, an A1 caregiver. And again, making sure that communication was very strong in managing the staff. And as a result of that, in my 20 first 20 years, uh, and then the, the remaining 20 years I, out of that 40, I was fortunate enough to lead teams where we had, I have had seven deficiency free surveys, meaning that just like in school, if you get 100, it's a perfect score. And there are only about 15% of nursing homes in the United States that achieve a deficiency free survey. And with nursing homes, they are evaluated under about 370 elements that the federal government looks at. And out of that 40 year career, I was also fortunate enough to be selected as Nursing Home Administrator of the Year for North Carolina. So out of that, my passion still continues 
to help people provide good quality care and make sure employees and staff are given the tools for them to be successful. That's awesome, Felton. And uh, just listening to uh, some of the, the, the key points that you brought up and that you uh, changed was one, uh, you felt as if that they didn't value you. And you knew that the only way that that change could happen is by you actually going into management. And then once you went into management, you made sure that not only the uh, people that worked uh, with and under you felt valued, but the people that you were taking care of uh, felt valued, which in turn made their families very comfortable with, uh, with working with you or knowing that whenever you're on board, you know, it was going to be something that was going to be excellent, uh, which is showing over the the uh, the extensive record that you've had, because, you know, I can imagine. Uh, you know, some of those uh, inspections, they may have been pop up, right, or do they just let you know all of the time when they're going to come? Oh, no. In the skilled nursing arena, they're all unannounced. So you have to be ready and doing things correctly at all times. And the other part of it is when they come in, they may view activities that are going on at the present time, but they're also looking back at records, other kind of information for the past 12 months. Okay. Well, one of the reasons that we're here today is uh, so that you can show your expertise in this field with uh, some people who possibly have a parent at home right now, they're taking care of them, and uh, also some of the people here that may be investors and they're looking to, uh, you know, find a different way to maximize their investment portfolio. And so with, with that being said, let's get jump right into uh, the things that's needed for everyone to get started. So for those of you looking up at my screen, uh, his website is up there, qualityoflifeeldercare.com. You guys will be able to go there. That's one of the first things he mentioned. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go to what you've come here for today, which is unlocking opportunities, assisted living facilities, investing in family care homes, seniors, and your legacy. So let's cover licensing so that that way uh, everybody will have a chance to, you know, kind of understand what's needed. All right. And uh, I'd also like our audience to just think about today we're having about 10,000 people per day turning 65. And so therefore the opportunity to take care of people is tremendous. And by the the year 2050, 20% of the population are gonna be seniors. So that's why I feel like it's so important that we're having this conversation. For the licensing arena, I think it's important because with my passion, I see that the way that people can really give quality care is having a smaller group of people that they are taking care of versus let's say in a nursing home or a combination nursing home and assisted living, they may have an assignment of one to 10 to 15 people per nursing assistant. But within a family care home, the ratio is one to six. So you're able to give that tender love and care. So I wanna focus on securing the license for a family care home. And that's a maximum of six people. And it's a home that has three or four or five bedrooms, but the the regulation is such that with a home, one bathroom can take care of support five people. Again, with the family care home license, the maximum number is six. So therefore you would need two bathrooms for a total of six people. The other, the other critical part in the first step of licensing and looking at a home you're thinking about utilizing as a family care home, uh, for an individual in a bedroom, one person in the bedroom, 
the square footage of the room is 100 square feet. If you have two people in a bedroom, and again, in a family care home, to license, you can only have a single person in a bedroom and no more than two. So within a, a bedroom with two people, the regulation is that there should there has to be at least 80 square feet per person in the bedroom. Right. So we're looking at uh the 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 10 by 10 is is about as the hundred square feet is about a 10 by 10, and then the 80 uh square feet for each person is about a 16 by 12, 16 by 14 size uh bedroom do do those bedrooms have to have baths or does it just matter that there's two uh in the house if there's more than five people that's right uh a, a minimum of two bathrooms if you have a total of six people if you have a total of five people the minimum requirement is one bathroom okay yeah so the licensing process, as you're evaluating, that's something you want to know immediately, because if you can't have that kind of space, it's no need to even move forward in securing a license. So, so again, in the, in the step that you know your house qualifies, and again, there are certain other things that I would help with determining the the specs for the house, but those are the two major, the bathrooms and the bedrooms. Then after that, you must have a licensed administrator. When you're submitting your application, you get the application from the Department of Health and Human Services, and you go through that process. But again, the licensed administrator, regardless of who is the owner, if it's a separate person, the licensed administrator is the one who is submitting the application and is signing off that everything is correct and it has been sent in under their supervision and involvement. And and, uh, and I assuming that uh, based on your experience and uh, everything that you've been involved with, that you would know, you know, how to handle that and... Uh, uh, especially with your deficiency-free uh, surveys, that you make sure that that house is going to be, you know, the right type of home for, you know, elderly people coming in. And then, of course, you know, you're very familiar with the paperwork. Can you do it in your sleep yet? Pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> uh, but and also with that application, and and it can range from six to nine months to get your license, there are going to be inspections that occur and, and that coincides with your application process because you're sending in information, then you have people coming in to verify what you've put in the application. But again, going through that checklist, when they come in, uh, I certainly know to make sure that they are correct and that's the purpose of the administrator. So what, what we're going to do now, and, and I know, of course, that there's going to be a lot more uh, on licensing. Uh, we're just pretty much touching the surface so that we can make sure people have a, a decent understanding of, you know, the basics. And for those who are uh, looking to move forward in the licensing, you know, we'll put something together so that that way they'll be able to sign up and, you know, attend that Zoom and uh, have everything. But once you, we get past the licensing, you know, we're looking at housing. So let's talk about the different client options and the different tiers of those candidates uh, so that that way they'll also have an idea. Because when we think of, uh, well, not to say we, but sometimes when I would think of an elder home or assisted living home, I'm always thinking of someone that's, uh, you know, maybe in a wheelchair or you know, they're, you know, 90 or 100 years old. And I know that there's a little uh, myth that the assisted living facilities are the exact same as a family care home. So why don't you share with us those different tiers and then maybe the differences 
that are in that family care home that you would not find uh, that's in an assisted living facility, which is, you know, over the uh, six people. Yes. Yeah. One of the important things is for, for those who own a home or building a home or um, uh, doing some remodeling, when you, you're completing your application, the first part of this whole process is for the owner to decide what they want. Do they want to have, and then I'll also go into the three primary categories and you're making the selection, but do you want people who are able to walk? Or do you want to have people who may walk or may need a wheelchair? Or do you want people who have certain kinds of conditions, uh, be it dialysis or it may be HIV or it may be veterans? That's not a condition, but just again, what is going to be your passion and why are you choosing to go into this and who do you want to provide that tender love and care? Um, so that in, 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 in looking at it, the combination of five people in a house or either six, uh, tier one might be individuals who are seniors um, that need some supervision. They can't live alone or they, they feel socially isolated. Their children or families are away. Uh, they may be a widow or a widower. Uh, they may be someone that's never been married and don't they don't, really don't have anyone to take care of them. And there might be uh, a slight quinge of dementia or confusion. They may they may be on little or no medication, but they're able to get up and walk around, but they need someone to manage and oversee their care. Uh, one of the myths is that with family care homes, assisted living or skilled nursing, you may think that the majority of the people are older, like you said, big, 80, 90 years old, but our society has changed, uh, especially in, in the way that, that of people's lifestyles. You're finding people in family care homes that are in their 50s and in their 60s. Uh, dementia is coming on earlier. Some people have not taken care of their bodies as well, and they need more care or they can't stay at home. So that's one of the myths of a family care home and assisted living that you're going to have older people. And that has changed dramatically over the last 40 years. So again, tier one are the residents or patients that need little or no supervision, but they can't really live on their own for several reasons. Tier two. Tier two, again, dementia is very prevalent. So dementia may be a little stronger in that tier two category. And often when people think dementia, that's one of the myth, myths. When people say dementia, they say, oh, that's Alzheimer's. The, the, the myth is Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. dementia. So I'm going to give you an example. We have tissue, and there may be clinics tissue. There may be Scott's tissue, other names of tissues. Dementia is that broad category like the umbrella of tissue. And under that umbrella of, uh, of dementia, you have Alzheimer's, you have Parkinson's, you have Lewy body, frontal lobe dementia. So in that tier two, you may have individuals who have progressed a little bit more in their dementia, and it could be more than one. Or they might have other conditions that are not dementia-related, but again, they can't take care of themselves. They can't cook for themselves. They can't manage their medications, and they don't have anyone that's close to them or their family's away, or they may just don't have that support. And they may need the socialization of being around others. So that's the tier two. Tier twos also may need 
a little bit more assistance in getting up and in the bed. May need just some assistance with getting their clothes on or taking it off. Uh, all right. Then the last category that we're looking at in the family care home is tier three. Tier three, the person may be more, uh, they, they may experience more of the elements of dementia, more confused. Uh, they may need a lot more assistance in getting up and out of the bed. Uh, they may need more medications. And again, you have staff in a family care home or are given the medication. They may need a lot more coaxing of uh, eating. They, they may can eat on their own, but they need someone to say, oh, take another bite or uh, let's try this. And also they may have uh, additional care factors. Uh, and I'll give one example. They, they might need a catheter, which collects the urine, uh, but a person can manage, uh, an individual can manage their own catheter bag, but if they have dementia or they have other conditions where they can't do it, again, in that, that tier three, staff can take care of uh, care needs that the individual can. So again, having one, two, and three is the, the, the way you would look at the clients you would admit in your family care home. So when we also look at that that first, second, and third tier and deciding on, especially depends on, you know, what you're passionate about. Uh, like I'm a veteran and I may decide that I want to make sure that veterans come into my home. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody may have, you know, been raising a family member that was, you know, in a wheelchair and, and they, they just have a certain akin to, you know, people with wheelchairs. So it's all just going to be really dependent on the person who decides to open a family care home or the person who already has someone in the family that needs that assistance to uh, file for that that licensing. And they already particularly have a, a client option that they inherited or that they could decide. Mm -hmm. That's right. So one of the things that I uh, that you know when we thought about uh, discussing this and and sharing this message was uh, the with the different types of properties that you worked in. I'm, I don't remember uh, if you actually gave the numbers of those those units, but at the same time, what makes the three bed two bath model something worth uh, getting into? Right. Well, it's worth getting into because I've managed uh, the smallest facility might have been 90 to 100 beds, meaning 90 to 100 people under one roof. The largest number is 360 under one roof. And even with those numbers, having the tier one, two, and three is important because what you're looking at is a community within a home-like setting and the socialization, how people interact with each other uh, is important. And that allows people to feel like they are, they're needed, fulfilled, because a tier one might provide a little bit more assistance to a tier, three, to a tier two or tier three. And the tier two and three may feel a lot more secure with people around them, some closer to their age group, that gives them that socialization. Uh, so it's a great model to have a combination of the tiers and or you can have all in the same category. Again, it's what your passion is and then how you're going to provide that good care within the context of um, the five or six people that are under one roof. Now, when we're we're looking at that five or six, and earlier you mentioned that at a uh, a larger care home like where you work, where it was ninety to a hundred, or you know up to three hundred people, that if I was a care provider, that I may have to have fifteen people to deal with during that shift. 
as opposed, and I, I think that's something that can kind of burn you out, uh, especially, you know, knowing all of those different personalities and, and how to handle that day in and day out. So do you think as far as uh, just the mental stability that something smaller might work out a little better too? Yes, yes, because caregivers, I always like to give the example of a cup. Uh, caregivers, you, you have your cup of coffee and, and you drink it and all of a sudden it's empty. It's the same situation with the caregiver. The caregiver is giving and giving, giving. So theirs are their 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 cup is getting emptier and emptier. And if you have 10 to 15 people that you're taking care of, uh, your cup can get empty pretty quick. And as a caregiver, you've gone in the profession because you want to take care of people. It's much more attractive to caregivers if you have a smaller ratio where you have one to five or six people that you're responsible for. And at the end of the day, you can feel like you've given your all, yet your cup is not empty yet. It's those caregivers who are giving, leave the shift, and they know they haven't been able to give the best care possible just by the sheer number of people. And then also, uh, as a caregiver, you're switching gears constantly because you've got different personalities and you need to know the language of the personality that you're working with so that you don't create any turmoil. So family care homes are a good model and you can attract caregivers who really want to do a good job and then can do a good job with the ratio of one to five or one to six. So before, before we get into the numbers, one of the questions that I have is, uh, and, and we're talking about the caregivers who sometimes there's a one in 15 ratio, and we're looking at if there's a uh, single family, three bed, two bath, uh, how many caregivers would you need uh, each shift, I'm presuming, for the uh, for for the six people if they're all, you know, different levels of care? Right. Uh, of course, with, with the family care home, you need the licensed administrator who oversees the operations, the policies and procedures, okay. and to make sure it's carried out on each shift. And then on the first shift, you have what is considered the supervisor in charge. And that person makes sure medication administration is conducted the way it should. Uh, and then you have one other caregiver on day shift. But that supervisor in charge is quasi-administrative as well as assisting with the care. Then the afternoon shift from 3 p.m. to 11, you have one person. And just remember, this is a ratio of one to five or six. And uh, then the night shift, you have one person. So that's the staffing pattern for a uh, a family care home. And okay, and, and looking at that staffing, is do any of them have to have particular licenses for those shifts or training? That's, right. That's one good thing that in a family care home, because you're taking care of what is considered the well elderly, even though there may be tears. Okay. So in comparison, sometimes people will get mixed up and they'll call a nursing home a rest home. Uh, and a rest home is associated with the assisted living category. So in a skilled nursing facility, you need a, a operation where you have a, a physician who oversees the medical operations, a registered nurse who manages the operations of all uh, nursing assistants and uh, LPNs or RNs. But in assisted living, you have the supervisor in charge that has uh, that is a med tech, and then you have a personal care aide that's not a licensed person but has been trained to take care of the needs of the more well elderly. So that's the big difference in family care home. You don't need all the licensed people because the medical conditions are not such that is required. And you, and again, with family care home, you don't take individuals who need extensive medical care. Uh, along with that, it just made me think, 
about not having to uh, have those types of qualifications involved, but is there like a minimum that they actually should know? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, when they get training and certified as a personal care aide, okay. uh, some of the aspects that uh, that involve their training, they, they learn how to lift properly. Because again, you might uh, have someone who needs some assistance getting in and out of the bed. Right. Uh, actually, if you, you happen to feed someone, knowing the better techniques in feeding, uh, if a person needs uh, changing because of uh, uh, bowel movement or urinating on themselves, uh, knowing how to watch somebody up appropriately. Uh, so that you don't cause infections. Um, out of that training, knowing how to take the vital signs, um, the blood pressure, temperature, and respiration, because that personal care aid does document those kinds of things. Uh, but we just keep in mind that compared to a nursing assistant who needs much more extensive training because of this because they're taking care of the sicker residents. The personal care aid does not have to do that because you're taking care of the well elderly. And then of course the supervisor in charge of uh, med tech, that person is trained in how to uh, give the medications and supervise that the person is taking the medication. Yeah, that's 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 awesome. And uh, just to uh, make sure that everybody knows that those differences, you know, in the educational levels of a family assisted home uh, as opposed to an actual nursing facility. Mm -hmm. So at, at this point, we're almost uh, at the end. And we've talked about the different tiers. We talked about uh, the different training that's needed. And so now it's just really looking at the uh, numbers for those who, you know, maybe have one person in and want to, you know, bring in some additional people. And then for those who are looking to uh, start a business in this, this arena, uh, that's something that we can cover now to just go over and you know, make a little bit more sense out of it. Right. And uh, Big, certainly I'd like you to talk more about the numbers because of your background in real estate. But as a business, it's certainly an opportunity because there's a need uh, of providing care to individuals, five people or six people under one roof. So at this uh, point, Felton, we just want you to share your contact information once again, and we will uh, put that in the description as well as uh, across the screen for, uh, for those who couldn't stay long and for those who may be watching this uh, after the recording. How can they reach yeah. you? Yes, and you can go to my website, and that is qualityoflifeeldercare.com. Again, that is qualityoflifeeldercare.com. Dot com. All right. So at this point, we're going to go over the numbers and I'm going to share the screen with you so you can follow along. Uh, you'll also in our description find uh, not only his website, but the information here where some of you registered for the Zoom that didn't receive an email or a text, uh, as well as the uh, uploaded video that shares some of this in case you wanted to review it. So right now we're gonna go over the numbers for the three bed, two bath. Uh, we're looking at uh, just doing an average here from 5K to 10K per room uh, in a family care home. So as Felton went over the assistance tier one, tier two, tier three, uh, the dollar amounts in those are between five and 6,000 for the assistance tier one, uh, which he reviewed the assistance tier two, 6,500 to 8,000 uh, and the assistance tier three, 8,500 to about ten thousand uh, plus dollars, right? So, at that point, we're gonna start with just a three bed, two bath, and that having just one person in each unit. 
So let's say if that average comes out to about 7,000, which is 21,000 monthly, 252,000 yearly. So we're saying that the combination of the three tiers may come out to about, let's say $7,000 a bed. And this is what that comes to. So now we're gonna also take a look at the staff, which of course we know is expenses. Now, even though the income, uh, we were just looking at the room, there are different uh, areas in this uh, opportunity where Felton can also share with you different ways to make income. So you're just not only looking at uh, what the room uh, rental is. And as well as, uh, depending on your business, you may have a uh, entry fee uh, into your place also. So with that staff expense, we're talking about the first shift and their level of education. And by them being a supervisor, you know, we're looking at about twenty dollars hourly, forty eight hundred monthly, which comes out to about fifty seven thousand six hundred yearly. Now, so we did this by eight hours times thirty days. Uh, so that would be something that uh, you would guys look at as you know being salary or having independent contractors uh, take these these positions. Uh, so you're looking at your second shift person, your third shift person at fifteen dollars hourly. Uh, which comes out to 3,600 monthly, 43,200 yearly. Uh, an administrator here in North Carolina averages, but you know between 55 and 70k annually. So we went with 62,000 divided by 12, uh, which comes out to about 5,167 dollars monthly. Now, of course, uh, nobody's going to work uh, 30 days straight every single month. So you can have a couple of different ships where someone might work three days on, two days off, three days on, two days off, so that you will still come up with these similar numbers. Unless, of course, you have that person that loves to work uh, 30 days on, two days off. So when we also look at food for the uh, family assistant living, we're looking at 500 monthly, which comes out to about 6,000 yearly. Now, a lot of you may uh, look at this number and think to yourself that it's uh, very low. Uh, but uh, as Felton, of course, with his experience, uh, you know, came up with those numbers. And uh, I, when I was going across the country assisting people saving their homes, uh, I also ran uh, into an elderly couple and the both of them together were uh, living off of fifty dollars a month, and that was in their budget for food. And so, with the five hundred monthly, you can give and take that depending on what you may serve. Uh, but there's a lot of ways that you can also cut back on the food by uh, just doing similar things that you you know do in, around the world. You know, you can have a garden or you can can things or, or, or the sort. But so we went with 500 monthly, which is 6,000 yearly. So when we break down that three bed, two bath with just one client per room, we're looking at that yearly income, which was 252,000. Those yearly expenses come out to 212,000, which those profits come out to 40,000 for that year. Now, when we take that 40,000, we look at the monthly income, 21,000. Remember, these are averages. The monthly expenses, $17,667. Then that monthly gross net comes out to about $3,333 after all is said and done. Now, I also want you to keep in mind that you still may have a mortgage payment. You're still going to have light bill, gas bill maybe lawn care, depending on uh, where you live. So that would also come out of that, that net after everything. Uh, and once again, as we did speak about the 7,000 monthly, there are additional services that you can have uh, when, you know, when people come to stay with you and felt to go over a couple of those. So some people, if they're renting, uh, they may not make $3,300 at the end of the month for just, you know, uh, if you're a landlord and you're you're renting out. So when you look at this and you still have, 
you know, for those who do have a mortgage or a high mortgage, these are not bad numbers. And of course, no one wants to break even. But let's look at it this way. Let's say you added one extra person, because remember, you can have up to six. You know, I myself, I probably wouldn't go any more than four uh, because I like to have, you know, people to have room to breathe. And uh, that would probably be my my sweet spot is four. So when we break down the three bed, two bath with four clients, that extra uh, 7,000 we put as an average, that would increase that yearly income now to 336,000. Those expenses would pretty much stay the same, 212. Your gross profits over that year at that point would be 124,000. And now you're looking at your monthly gross net at 10,000. $333 around that area. So that's a lot more for you to uh, not only be able to take care of the mortgage and all of those other additional things, but just do things around the house to make it even, you know, uh, better and more home feeling for, for your guests. Uh, and just like we talked about the PIT payment, the light, the gas, the water, the lawn care, and uh, one thing that I just want to mention quickly is some of you may decide that you want to move forward and also become an administrator. Uh, and so every state has different rules to become an administrator. But let's say you decided to uh, actually become an administrator, you know, after about two years or so of your of everything running and then you're taking the class and then you're you know, learning firsthand, you're also looking at saving an additional $5,167 monthly for your location. So if you look at four people and add an additional $5,167, you're well over 15000 And then if you decide just to have three people uh, there's a possibility that you as an administrator will still clear close to 10,000 and you can still have those three people. Uh, Felton, can you go over a couple of the uh, instances where they might be able to save on some, uh, some of the money or uh, increase the income with different services? Right. Uh, just as Big mentioned, uh, in our society, a lot of people have grown up uh, with gardens, and that's also a good activity uh, for someone to participate in. But even with a garden, when you look at the cost of food and, and uh, meal service, if you have a garden and you plant um, corn or tomatoes or um, any of the items, you can then can them and freeze them, and that gives that decreases your food costs, and it also gives you fresh vegetables. So that's again a, a savings, and I've seen many facilities do that. Um, then also how you can increase your income, even though you have your standard rate for uh, the what you really consider room and board and caregiver services. But you could have a menu of different services, such as uh, hair care services uh, for men and for women, pedicures or manicures, uh, services for individuals that desire to go on uh, shopping trips or go within the city, but not go with the group. Uh, so you have a charge that you could uh, supply someone to take that person to areas or stores that they particularly want to. And also, depending on the level of care, uh, if it's to tier one, two, or three, then if there's some additional care factors that are needed, um, and I'll just share, let's say the person uh, is a, a tier one, but they they be they need more uh, care with um, uh, their incontinence, meaning they they may wet on themselves or they may have other kind of um, uh, problems with uh, in incontinence and you need diapers, 
things like that, there could be an additional charge. So there are other kinds of services that can uh, be included on the menu that if a family desires to take advantage of it, uh, that would be a fee for service. All right, so that's definitely uh, something to look at is uh, a lot of the uh, people who may have someone in their homes already, they could see that as a you know source of income to help uh, pay pay the different bills and also you know put some money away for their children who may be getting ready to go to college, uh, as well as uh, some of the people who just decide to you know build from the ground up and uh, actually design a uh, senior care living facility uh, because you're looking at maybe five to a five to six bedroom home, four to five baths. And uh, when you're looking at the return on the investment by the number of people in there, you know, that's something that can actually, you know, pay that property off and uh, easily, you know, five to, to seven years, uh, which could also be leveraged into, you know, other opportunities. Mm hmm. Uh, Felton, before we move on uh, any further, can you share uh, with our listeners uh, once again how they can reach you and uh, any other other uh, remarks before we go into the, the Q&A session? All right. Yes, you can reach me by going to the website, qualityoflifeeldercare.com. Again, qualityoflifeeldercare.com. And i just like to leave uh, our viewing and listening audience with uh, this thought. Uh, when there's a particular problem, uh, that gives a person the opportunity to solve it. And of course, it could be a business. And with 10,000 people turning 65 every day, and also, our population is living much longer than they lived in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Medical uh, care, quite able to keep the body living for quite a long time. And with the prevalence of dementia, people are needing care, needing assistance. And their mind may not be as keen as it was, and they can't live on their own, but their body is pretty strong. So again, the family care home model is a model that you can give good care, and it is quite financially profitable uh, business that a person can do so. So those are my parting thoughts about this profession and this industry and the future of it. Golden, we definitely like to uh, thank you for, you know, coming on and sharing that information. I know there's a lot of people here that have uh, questions. So before any of you guys come on, what we want to make sure is that uh, you basically, you know, say your name, where you're from, and then proceed with your question. Now, we're also putting together all of those questions so that when we do the recording and everybody who's attended and you receive that recording, You'll also see, you know, all of those different questions with the answers on that website. So at this point, uh, we're going to open everything up for the questions and uh, hopefully we can answer some of them and uh, just, you know, make sure that we can take care of you the same way we're hoping that you will be taking care of those of us who are approaching that age. <laughs> okay.